And you know, the Lord's Prayer and Luke and the Lord's Prayer and Matthew aren't the same. Uh, and the Lord's Prayer we say on Sunday in worship isn't the same as either Matthew. And what we say on Sunday isn't the same as what we learned when we were kids. So is there, is there a best or most accurate or a way that we should say the Lord's Prayer? And we talked a little bit about the difficulty of translating from ancient Greek to modern English, which is also an evolving language. And the answer was essentially no. There can't be an exact set of modern day English words that this is it. This is the way you should say it. And so once we we had concluded that, Carol says, so. <laughs> Did you know that there are a whole lot of other versions of the Lord's Prayer out there? And she had brought some examples for us. And they were written in a little bit more everyday uh, English language. Um, it's kind of expanding a little bit about what we mean from the various phrases in the Lord's Prayer. But a really good discussion. Um, in the middle of it, someone in the group said, okay, I have to say this. I just like the Lord's Prayer the way it is. It's comforting. Um, we know it really well. It's just, you know, you say the Lord's Prayer, and it seems to me like it should be this word, these words. And so I opened my mouth uh, and said, I get what you're saying, but is it possible that if we know something so well that we can merely say it in our sleep, that we can say it at the drop of a hat? Um, that we know all of the words, is it possible that we don't always take the time to really think about what we're praying? Are we not aware of what we're actually saying to God, what God might be saying to us? And maybe some of these kinds of prayers, like what Carol found, would help us think through that. Um, and like the good Lutherans we were, we went away from that text study with a both hand conclusion. It's good as a comforting, well known, easy to say prayer. We also might be a little weak on taking any time to really think about what we're saying. So you might think that um, after that, in worship the following Sunday, that would be the end of conversations about the Lord's Prayer because we just don't do that very often. But no. Um, the following week at text study, um, Pastor Seth walks in, puts a bunch of roll up papers there. And I had thought at first I was going to hold it, so I would talk about it, and then I realized I don't have four hands. Um, so then I tried to put it there, and I assumed that the book of you cannot read it from there. <laughs> so there are a few copies on the table, and you can come and look at it afterwards. But this is some calligraphy um, that someone from his home congregation gave him. Um, she had liked to do a career but was downsizing at this point, and she thought that Pastor Seth and some of the people in his church might like a copy of this. And so he said, we had such a good discussion on the Lord's Prayer, I brought, brought these here for you to look at. So what uh, we have here is, the, this uh, woman's name was Margaret Beatty, um, and she has a traditional Lord's Prayer written as a frame. Um, and then this is the Lord's Prayer in Norwegian. This is the Lord's Prayer in Nespers. This is in German. This is a version of it that she found in a family Bible. Uh, this is Hawaiian. This one, I just thought wasn't attributed to anything. And while we were waiting to get started, uh, Sharon says, I really like that one that goes backwards. So, okay, I looked at this in 10,000 times, and I did not notice that this one starts with our father at the bottom. And it goes in the beginning and then ends on forever. And so take the time to read that one. It's just kind of unique to read it in that direction. And the final one is in French. So that would have been another conversation you might not expect about how do we think about the Lord's Prayer? Um, both the kinds of things Carol had brought up, and also it wasn't translated just from Greek to English. It was translated from to a multitude of modern languages, all of which um, may be changing. Um, and then a little while later, in a hallway conversation with Pastor Seth, 
Um, we had found out early on in when we were still just visiting on the stage that um, since when he talks about his own congregation, it was the church that he was born and baptized in, redeemed with the and great false. And at that time, the pastor of that church was my dad. And so here comes this little six degrees of separation to her to the Lord of her conversation. Turns out that Margaret Baby did this calligraphy in the 80s. She remembers my dad. She remembers him being her pastor. So then you're starting to think a little bit like, how did the Lord's Prayer just suddenly start popping up like this all the time? Um, but life gets busy. And then a couple weeks later, we come to church and discover that worship and music has planned a season of creation. And we're going to go away from the lectionary and have these uh, worship services on creation. And they have chosen to insert the New Zealand Lord's Prayer. <laughs> so for four Sundays, you know, it's like, Lord's Prayer is back. Um, and we couldn't do the comforting, easy, familiar prayer thing. We actually had to have our hopes in our hand and, um, and think about the words we were praying. And I really liked that prayer. It, it, to me, it expanded our view of it. And so it was about that time that I said to someone, you know, this could probably be a good forum topic. And just like magic, I've been asked to be on the forum planning committee. <laughs> and I get a letter from George saying, hey, I heard you were interested in a communion committee and you might want to give a forum on the Lord's Prayer. And I'm going, there's no magic in it. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, well, I thought someone might want to give a forum on the Lord's Prayer. But he also added in his email that they were heading out on their vacation would be um, out of touch for a while. And so this little voice inside of me said, okay, I'm going to have to answer it now. <laughs> um, and then another couple of weeks went by. And in the morning, fairly early each morning, I get on my tablet, my iPad, and look at email and social media. And on that particular day, um, I'll just let you use that script. This was the first thing that the very first thing I saw on my iPad came on. And I don't know if you're familiar with Man Overboard, but he does cartoons regularly, and they're always done in a way to um, poke at you a little bit. Uh, many of them are biblical or Christian related, but some are just human nature, some are current events, um, other things that it's just a way to get you to think. And this one, was on the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> and so Jesus is the guy in white. It's probably not obvious from this particular cartoon that the little green uh, bot looking thing, that is his, how he pictures God. So that's God besides Jesus, you know, true man, true God. And then the dude in the red shirt walks in. Okay, boss, I want to talk about this prayer of yours. So thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What about my will? When's my kingdom coming? And daily bread just means don't worry about tomorrow or want what you don't have. And trespass against me? So only by forgiving others am I forgiven? I thought prayer was supposed to change things. I thought it was supposed to make a difference. But all it's doing is making me more humble and grateful and for... Oh. <laughs> and Jesus says, comes to the Lord. <laughs> Uh, and honestly, this is maybe my comes the dawn moment where suddenly it's like, oh, this is why I liked New Zealand so well. This is like why I opened my mouth and said, is there a concern that we're a little superficial about this and just rattle off the words? Maybe that should have been, is this a concern that I'm a little superficial about this and just rattle off the words? Um, and so I emailed George. I said, I, I will do it. <laughs> and I sent him the cartoon. Um, and so then it's like, oh dear, I need to find something. I need to figure out what I'm going to say. And I found a paper um, by a person named Jerry Lineman. I didn't know who he was, so I had to look up, see what his credits were. We are probably as far apart on a faith walk. Uh, tradition as we could be. He's an evangelical, very conservative theologian. But this paper really spoke to me. 
And one of the most important points he made in it is that the Lord's Prayer is not just a prayer. It's a vision for life in Christ's in breaking kingdom. It's an acknowledgement of the injustice, hunger, and evil of this broken world. It's a statement of faith, a call to worship, a battle cry. It's a bold pleading for divine glory, social renewal, and heaven on earth transformation. And because of this, the Lord's Prayer is not just meant to be a prayer. It's meant to be lived. I know that I had just never thought of the Lord's Prayer as a way to be lived. I look at all of those explanations in the middle, and it's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's part of what I believe. We work here to help people who are hungry. We work against injustice. I'm really not sure about the ballot right part. I would have to talk to this guy to wonder what that means. But And I expect that maybe Jeremy Linderman and I would look at some of those words and maybe interpret them differently. Like my idea of social renewal might not be his idea of social renewal. But what's important is God's idea of social renewal. And if both of us can dig deeper and learn something more about the Lord's Prayer and realize how powerful it is, then the Lord's Prayer and God has done, done the work. And so this was my first thought that, yeah, maybe I really haven't been all that serious about it. Another thing that Lenneman said in his paper was that Tertullian said, the Lord's Prayer is a summary of the gospel. Um, and, and you look at it, and you look at these things, and you say, wow, yeah, it probably is. So what I want to do today is first just ask you some questions, get you guys involved in what you think of this so far, what you think of the idea that the Lord's Prayer should be lived, um, how you've used it. And then we're going to look at several versions of the Lord's Prayer and, and just have some discussion. No right answers, no wrong answers. I am not voting for one as the best. <laughs> um, uh, it, you know, if we were to say, oh, oh, well, that one, that's way better. And we started using it every single Sunday. Within a short time, we would have mem memorized it and we could be able to say it off. And so really the idea is to think, when I say how would be, be that name, what do I actually mean? Like, what are other ways to help me explain um, what that prayer might be saying to God? So first, a couple of questions. One of the things I realized is I really don't pray the Lord's Prayer outside of worship. In my personal part of life, I do pray, but I don't sit by myself and pray the Lord's Prayer. Um, so how do you use the, prayer, the Lord's Prayer outside the worship service, or do you? And is there a time when the Lord's Prayer was particularly meaningful to you? That at that moment in time, whatever was happening, it was just really the right prayer, so to speak. So um, this is when I momentarily for a nanosecond put on my pastor Seth hat and say, so what did you notice? <laughs> Like that. I'll say that later. I, I have always wondered why we start with our Father who art in heaven because I thought that now Jesus is here. I used uh, the worst prayer outside of worship uh, close every Senate Council meeting for 10 years with it. We pray the Lord's Prayer at the end of our uh, uh, dinner meal together to kind of close our time um, together. So we always close with the Lord's Prayer. There was a, there was a particularly meaningful time for me uh, with the Lord's Prayer, and that was on a Monday, Thursday, <clears throat> in the old town of Jerusalem, the old city, and the Church of the Redeemer, which is a ELCA church. And um, my son and I were attending that service, and when I, I really get so emotional, I can hardly talk about it because at the time of the Lord's Prayer, we were invited to pray it in whatever, whichever language we speak. And I heard all these different languages around me. 
and people at different times the phrases end and it wasn't just a little bit of a bit like we're used to hearing normally and it was so moving to think of this prayer uniting christians all over the world on that particular um, moment in the church calendar um of course uh, i think mostly it's uh it was in corporate prayer a lot of times that we use that i use the lord's prayer but one of the precious most precious corporate times I was able to experience it, and it was for a couple of years. It was while my uh, grandchildren were going to the lambs, and every week, um, Pastor bucks out of the <laughs> uh, text study and does the chapel with the kids, with, with Jerry. And uh, they had developed the, the Lord's Prayer with the hand signals. And uh, it was so wonderful to see these little kids. Who really had no association with the church? They weren't uh, children. I think of uh, parishioners. They weren't, uh, you know. And and this was this was how they're gonna remember this for the rest of their lives. Well, I was thinking about this um, as a teenager and child. I uh, seldom heard my parents argue or dispute anything. But every night um, from their bedroom, I heard them pray together the Lord's Prayer. And, and I think I was blessed to, um, to witness this kind of context of their marriage and their commitment in that marriage through that prayer. So I think what I hear and what I started thinking about myself is that the Lord's Prayer is a prayer of community. It's a prayer of connection. And so whether we say it at the end of one meal, we hear our parents say it, we see little children learning it, we, we say it at the end of a, of a council meeting of people of faith, it, it brings us together. We're united on Sunday morning with millions of people across the globe by saying that prayer. Um, and I had a thought. <laughs> well, let's go on to the next question. So um, the other um, the other questions that kind of a little bit go together. Where do you fall in that continuum of it's really comforting? That's how the Lord's Prayer is supposed to sound. I just like it. Or, yeah, I don't know if we ever really think a whole lot about what we're praying. Um, and both, maybe. Uh, but, and then what did you think of the New Zealand's Lord's Prayer on the four Sundays that you, that you used it? Did you find some value in that? I like the New Zealand prayer very much because it speaks to us as a version of today's what would we say very important considerations and it's always difficult to take something that you use every day and modify it a little bit so that you see how it relates your regular version with the way you think into into when you're thinking about something that is important in our lives today specifically and that's exactly why we're gathered here today to see if, if we can make that happen so what i want to do now is um look at four versions of the lord's prayer and um and we will go through them I think I maybe divided them into the petitions, but I didn't actually check what the petitions are. Confirmations, but I won't come. I just think you all to me. <laughs> um, and so I want to just give you a little bit of the background or the theological foundation of these so that you know these aren't just um, somebody sitting around in coffee and saying, I just don't like those words in the Lord's Prayer. It would be cool if we, we did this. That, that, that there was thought put into it, that there may have been an intended audience for it. So you just know what we're talking about. 
So in the, um, I guess it's our left, <laughs> is um, the traditional Lord's Prayer. And by that, I mean the one that we use on Sunday morning, uh, not the one we learn uh, um, as children. And so that's the very, very, very familiar one that we can all say. The next column is New Zealand, which is somewhat familiar because we just used it for four weeks. And so we're aware of it. The next one says urban indigenous, and that is a prayer that's used by Great Spirit United Methodist and in Portland. And um, I got that from George, and they go down there and worship sometimes. Their um, pastor is Reverend Dr. Alan Black, and he's a member of the Cherokee Nation, and they're a primarily indigenous group of people. And so that is not really familiar. I don't think any of us had seen it before, but it very much connects to Iowa State's mission in our goal to develop relationships and understanding um, with the uh, local indigenous people that we share this land um, for. And then in the fourth column, we just kind of jump off the cliff. <laughs> Did y'all know there was a Beyonce mask? <laughs> Thank you, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so um, the Beyonce mask um, is a womanist worship service that uses the music and personal life of Beyonce as a tool to foster an empowering conversation about Black women, their lives, their bodies, and their voices. And um, it's they, they make a little point of saying, um, this is not any attempt to deify Beyonce, to say she's a prophet, that she was thinking Christian thoughts, but it's more, um, that it uh, is a tool to um, speak to Black women who have thrived for centuries, even as they've been undervalued and underestimated. Um, so uh, a womanist mass, a womanism is a practice that recognizes and celebrates the lives, beauty, culture, spirituality, and experiences of Black women. And it's committed to the survival, well being, and wholeness of all people. Um, so, really, beyond my normal box I live in, but I found it very interesting. Um, this prayer was curated by Reverend Yolanda Norman. She's the H. Eugene Fargo Chair of Black Church Studies at San Francisco Theological Seminary. And it was in her Black Studies class that her seminary students worked with her to develop this mass. And when I saw the Lord's Prayer, I thought of the version that they came up with, it's like, oh, that's worth bringing into the conversation. If you're not real familiar with Beyonce, um, <laughs> which I suspect several of you aren't, an example is her songs, Flawless and All. Flawless and All. The chorus of that song says, um, I don't know why you love me, and that's why I love you. You catch me when I fall, accept me, flaws and all, and that's why I love you. And that's why I love you. And so the question kind of becomes, um, what if flaws and all is a song about a complicated relationship with God? Can we connect it that way? So what we're going to do here is I will actually read four versions of a petition. And then you can tell me what you noticed. <laughs> so we say our Father in heaven. Um, New Zealand said, Eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. Um, Great Spirit United Methodist said, creator whose home is everywhere in heaven and on earth, which speaks a little bit to what Marilyn said. Um, and Beyonce says, our mother, um, who is in heaven, and within us. So what do you think? What are there pieces that you go a little bit like what you were saying that it, it widens it more to our everyday culture and language, but what's, what speaks to you or what doesn't speak to you? Um, you know, could you comfortably sit down and pray at our mother? Um, well, I, I mean, I maybe could. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I really like the New Zealand one because it uh, gives a broader picture. 
And I like the phrase in whom is heaven. I think that's a really interesting use of words. I, I agree because I think we've had some thoughts historically about or culturally about heaven being this place plated and rolled up in the sky somewhere that that we're not part of. And so the idea that that God is heaven is in God um, is is very nice. Just quickly, I, on the Beyonce prayer, I really think it brings us um, more intimacy and belonging within us. Uh, it's important. And, you know, I think I could, could occasionally pray our mother. Um, I, I like that New Zealand says father and mother. The, um, uh, the, the urban indigenous congregation. Um, they just don't put that male femaleness in there. Um, but I think all of them are a little more broader than just father in heaven. Um, and, the, and so hopefully, at, next time we pray, our father in heaven, some of this will be more uh, meaningful, give us more expansive um, version of what that prayer might be saying. So next, how will it be your name? New Zealand says the howling of your name echo through the universe. Uh, urban indigenous says uh, your name is most sacred of all. And we're blocking it just a little bit, but Beyonce says we call upon your names with an S on it. So what do you think of that? I think again, it just kind of broadens the vision of what it is that we call upon your names, plural, makes me think back to New Zealand in the first petition. Um, that, that while there are plenty of ways in which God is a father, there's all kinds of other ways that, that God connects to us. I think it's kind of interesting in the Beyonce one that maybe the connection between the calling upon and the hallowing, maybe those are somehow connected. Okay. It's a, yeah, isn't that an interesting yeah. thought? The way that they framed that makes you kind of ask that question. So that by calling on God, we are hallowing God. That's, that's a, a really nice um, thought about what that prayer might mean. Um, so going on, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Uh, New Zealand says, the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your beloved community of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. Um, the uh, creative spirit uh, congregation says, let your holy intentions for all creation become reality here and everywhere. And Beyonce Ness says, your wisdom come, your will be done in all the spaces in which you dwell. Does anybody notice there or like or how does that expand, um, expand your vision of your kingdom come and will be done on earth as in heaven. Well, I think it just uh, speaks to what you said by that other author about this is a way of life. This is how we should live. You know, mm -hmm. this, is the gospel. This, this is a prayer that we live. This is the gospel. It's a summary of the gospel. That we want justice for everyone. We want it throughout the world. Um, that uh, we want God's wisdom and will to be done in all the spaces. Um, that, that we live. I just think that was a... It looks like the New Zealand um, version gives a more concrete way of how this um, is going to happen in the world, and it involves us more than the others do. I think that's a really valid point. It, it doesn't just say, oh yeah, we want your will be done. It gives us concrete ways that God's will might be done. The other thing is that um, the word kingdom 
I don't think necessarily translates well to like our teenagers. We don't really, you know, so that way I think that the others uh, are better, but maybe give an easier version. Um, and yes, I felt like that after we got through it. They, it um, kingdom is a hard word to translate from the Greek and probably more than we can deal with here. But there is a lot of the language that is a little bit warrior trooping in on his white steed to be in charge and, and take the world. And I think that that's maybe what some of the people um, hear in that. And some of this more expansive language helps explain what we might mean by that. Um, where are we? Okay, so forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. New Zealand says, in the truths we absorb from one another, forgive us. Uh, Creative Spirit says, accept our acts of re reconciliation for the balancing of life. And uh, Beyonce says, remind us of our limits as we give grace to the limits of others. I like the Beyonce one on this um, because you know remind us of our limits. Uh, you know it isn't um, you know I think again forgive us our sins. Well, we need to forgive us our sins, but do we really do we realize that um, uh, you know the, the language of of we it remind us of our limits so that we can give grace to other people's limits um, or that. Reconciliation helps create a balance of life. Oh, geez, sorry. Did I undo everything? You okay? I'm fine. Just a what, what speaks to me is that if we were all sitting around the table and we read just the traditional, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sit against us, that Together, we would come up with all of those other things. I think the word sin is so familiar to us. And so what I like is in the second one, the word hurts. And in the fourth one, the word limits. Um, I think that expands um, and it makes us think about uh, rather than the word sin, which is so overused and, and maybe conflicted for us. Not in, not in this one, but some of the others say debts, and people have a tendency to take that literally. So yes, I think that we aren't hearing any kind of new theology in these prayers. I think that if we sat down and really put our minds to it, we could have come up with all of these. I think the idea that that limits and um, hurt is would be um, more understandable to people who are part of a faith group or who are, are young people. Um, and so I don't see in any of these prayers something that is like, yeah, no, we don't believe that, we can't do that. It's really taking this opportunity to try and think um, about what all this might mean. Um, so on to save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. Um, the New Zealand prayer says, in times of temptation and tests, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. And from the grip of all that is evil, free us. Uh, great Spirit United Methodist says, and I like this one, keep us from foolish decisions that benefit only ourselves. <laughs> um, protect us from enemies that threaten the sacred balance. And the Beyonce now says, separate us from the temptation of empire and deliver us into community. I remember uh, at a Bible study, I think it was the Cal, the Cal and Bible study, uh, they uh, looked at the Lord's Prayer and they added, uh, um, they have a small time of trial and deliver us from the evil that we do. Who deliver us from the evil that we do. Oh, and I kind of like that. 
but instead of a doubt there. Yeah. Yeah. So again, it's um, just pulling apart what um, words like evil, um, even deliver us mean. And, um, you know, the temptation of empire is a very real thing in this day and age. Um, uh, I, I think that the world has always had um, people who were so intent on gaining power and riches that they, you know, from the time of knights who would use their serfs for anything, that's a, a human weakness that we have, that, that there are some people who want to have power and riches regardless of what the cost it is for the people around them. And so I think it's a constant in the, the sinful nature of human people. And, and we see that very much today as, um, as much as we would see it if we looked back through history. And I think that for someone like Beyonce, um, living in the world that she lives and all those around her must live, you know, so much that they have and are tempted with, uh, and she's really wanting to separate, you know, divide from that and, and deliver us into community, you know, help others. Yeah. Yeah. But I thought of was here's where I, I like the word kingdom because the kingdom of God, you never hear of the empire of God. It distinguishes between the two. Yeah. Yeah, as we read through, I'm finding I like the group of native. I like some of the thoughts, the way that they express them. The one just above it where it says, our acts of reconciliation. That's just wonderful. I mean, you know, it's, it praises the ability to get along, make mistakes, and solve the problem. And then, the, but in the next one, I, I like it all except the word enemies. I've always objected to people who say, he's my enemy, she's my enemy. I, I, it, they could, it could have said protect us from those that threaten the sacred balance and be just as well, but enemies is such a trigger word uh, that, um, but, but I still like that uh, urban name. Yeah. I do too, and if you haven't been to church yet, um, Pastor says sermon addresses a little bit of the idea of enemies and the bad people that will be. I was kind of thinking about that too, Dave. Um, the different versions, there's there's three different quote unquote traditional versions of the Lord's Prayer, the one from Matthew, the one from Luke, and the one from a book called the Didache. Um, and one of those, I think it's the Matthew version, says um, not deliver us from evil, but deliver us from the evil one. And so I see that in there, the native one. But it does, it raises that question. So yeah, there again, even just comparing those three sort of quote unquote original versions, the different ideas that come up, it's interesting. And I think from what all of you are saying, I sense that that word community at the end of the Beyonce version is really one of those important parts. It goes back to what we said about the beginning when people talked about how the Lord's Prayer is meaningful to them. Most of those examples were about connecting with someone else, about praying together. And, um, and so, and to keep us from foolish decisions that benefit only ourselves would help bring us into community. So I think that that's one of the, the uh, strong meetings that threads through this. And, um, and I agree with you on enemies. Um, that is another one of those basic weaknesses of um, a human being, is that there's this temptation in order to convince myself or the world or someone else that I'm right, somebody else has to be wrong. And, um, and so, yeah, I might like that better than the ghost was in there, but um, it is a beautiful way to say the Lord's Prayer. Um, and the last petition for the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever, amen. Um, New Zealand says, for you reign in the glory of the power of his love, now and forever. Um, the urban native says, teach us to respect your power in the universe that is revealed through all creation. And uh, Beyonce says, for you are the dwelling place within us, 
the empowerment around us, and the celebration among us now and forever. Amen. Anybody have any comments about that? I actually like uh, the, the concept in the Beyonce one about God dwells in us. God is around us, empowering us to do things, and God is in our celebrations with each other. Um, that's it's a it's a nice thought, um, and you know again talking about kingdom is not a bad word. Kingdom is just a word that is probably kind of easy to misinterpret by somebody who doesn't know it. And so you're talking the kingdom and the power and the glory, and you come back, you know, and but. New Zealand says you reign in the glory of the power that is love. And I think that's the difference between kingdom when we're saying Lord's Prayer or talking about God, is that God's kingdom is about love. God's kingdom isn't about temptation of empire. Um, big, big difference in how we use that word kingdom. Uh, so I just, this is the prayer, the, the slide that I showed earlier. And I'm just wondering um, any thoughts that anyone might have overall about the discussion that I, someone has already mentioned it. This makes me think about the fact that the Lord's prayer should be lived. Um, you know, what, what in going through those petitions, in listening to this, and even thinking about the little cartoon at the beginning, um, does this in any way um, deepen your knowledge of the Lord's, not knowledge, your love of the Lord's Prayer? Um, does it expand uh, your sense of, of what you are praying about when you say the Lord's Prayer? Um, is it something that you might think about next time you pray the Lord's Prayer? This is... <laughs> So perhaps I can take a, a little different approach to some of the questions that you outlined and say that when we talk about these various versions of the Lord's Prayer, they're all about the words. But words, in my perspective, can be misinterpreted in any context, and especially words that are so charged. Uh, when I think of prayer, I don't think in terms of words. Uh, so from my own personal uh, spiritual uh, perspective, uh, music, non-verbal non music is what I think of as prayer. And so uh, an example that some of you might be familiar with is uh, John Coltrane, who was a uh, very uh, outstanding uh, saxophonist in the mid 20th century uh, and has become almost a saint. Uh, there, there is a church of saint John Coltrane. Um, and the song that he is most known for is A Love Supreme, which I think of as the embodiment of the Lord's Prayer. But it doesn't say it. There's no words to it that would imply that other than love, a love supreme. And so that becomes the way of thinking differently about what that act of prayer is outside of the verbal manifestation of it. And so that's a little bit what Foz and all was for the Beyonce matters. Um, Beyonce was not talking about God. Um, we were, they were using her music to inspire people to think about that. Um, and it's probably the reason that I said earlier, I'm not advocating that we change which words prayer we use, because it isn't the actual words. Um, you know, there, there, there isn't bad words in the version, the version we say. Um, it's really more of taking a time and a space to think about it. And, and you know, and maybe as you think about it, you're almost just, oh, wow. But it's music. It's, it's, it's these, these songs that I know or this person. Or maybe it's that piece of art. Um, or, or maybe it was an experience I had as a child listening to my parents. Um, really not an intent to either say, this is what that line means, or to say, this version is better than that version, but to take time to talk together and say, how can we gain a deeper, deeper understanding 
from these particular contemporary ways of, um, of saying the Lord's Prayer. Well, I just want to say thank you so much um, for this presentation because I think it has helped remind us to get out of our childhood prayer of, I want this, I want that, could you do this for me? And instead, um, that prayer is a request that we become something, that we change, and that we grow, and that our focus is on community and creation and um, much larger things than sometimes uh, our individual prayer life can get us stuck. So thank you for expanding my thoughts. So, um, and yes, I, I do think that when the cartoon was uh, in that too, that if we don't take time once in a while to think about what we're praying, um, we, it will maybe come all about us. So I just wanted to close um, with another version of the Lord's Prayer, in case you haven't seen enough. This is a response to the Lord's Prayer, and uh, the bolded line is the traditional prayer that we pray, and, um, and then the lines under it are again an interpretation of what that might mean. And so um, I will say the, the bolded portions, and then I'd like you to respond with what's underneath that. So let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, we are in this day. Thank you. 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 Thank Yours is the name written upon our hearts. Thy kingdom come. May it be a kingdom of peace, not prejudice. May it be a kingdom of sharing, not grasping. May it be a kingdom of hope, not hurting. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May, May your word be more of the print on the page. May your justice be more of the wish of our hearts. May your word become our deepest desire. Give us this day our daily bread. Let us taste it in the kisses of loved ones. Let us fill us with the empty moments of our lives. Let us slip out of our hands to mend the brokenness of our work. And forgive us our debts as we forgive others. May those who have hurt us find a welcome in our hearts. Even, Even as we have found our home in yours. And lead us not into temptation. Turn, Turn our hearts from the seductions of the world and simple pleasures that turn us from you. Keep, Keep us from thinking we are, we are so important that, that we ignore those around us. Help us to always bring others to you in prayer before we bring ourselves. But deliver us from evil. Not just great evils of war, but from ingratitude, self love, pride, and all those little evils that do such great harm. For thine is the kingdom, our heart's true longing, and the power which is satisfied for the service and weakness, and the glory which we revere in our lives, our bodies, our minds, our souls. This, this day, day and every day. Forever and ever. Amen. So we do one more slide yet. So thank you. That's what I have. Um, the, the painting is up there if you wanted to look more closely at it. The uh, Twitter feed prayer is up there if you wanted to, to look at that, especially the one that's upside down that I never even knew until this morning. Um, and, and I hope that it's been some kind of meaningful discussion for you about our most beloved prayer. Um, and then it gives you a sense of um, how it brings us together in community, how it's a summary of the gospel, and, and how it is, um, how, how, we, how we should live um, as Christians in the world of faith. Uh, yeah, I can send out slides if, if, as long as I know right now. Um, yeah, we'll get something to write down or um, <clears throat> no.
also be on uh, set aside on the YouTube site tomorrow. Cindy will have it up on, on Monday because we recorded this as well. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I, I think I have. I'm sure, you do. I'm sure we have it. All right, thank you. <laughs> 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 